Well, the whole idea of disease X is about being proactive. It's 20 times deadlier than COVID-19, but doesn't yet exist. We look at how health experts plan to stop disease X. She is so happy that she has two of everything now. A young girl got pierced ears after reconstructive surgery gave her a new ear. And January is National Radon Action Month. How to protect yourself from the radioactive gas. Welcome to Ion Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Michael George. We begin with a new report from the American Cancer Society. For the first time, the ACS expects more than 2 million Americans will get cancer this year, with more than 600,000 deaths. This rise is concerning because it's being driven by people under 50. We spoke with a colorectal cancer survivor who knows how important getting screened is. It's been nearly 10 years since Diane Nathaniel learned she had stage 3 colorectal cancer. She says she was misdiagnosed for years. I complained of constipation, and I was always told I was anemic, so given iron pills, kind of dismissive. I complained of migraines, a weight loss. Eventually, she suffered rectal bleeding. A colonoscopy found a more than five centimeter mass. She was just 44 years old. I was terrified. Uh, also knowing that I had three children, I had a husband, um, a whole life ahead of me. Colorectal cancer is now the leading cause of cancer death in men under 50 and second for women in the same age group, according to the American Cancer Society. All we really know is it has to be broadly in something environmental. When we see this cohort effect, it's not inherited genetic mutations or something else that's part of the germline. This has to be some sort of exposure or diet change. Prevention is key. The American Cancer Society recommends starting colorectal screening at age 45. The percentage of folks who actually undergo screening under the age of 50 remains low. Increasing screening rates, I think, would be incredibly important. Overall, cancer mortality continues to decline, but that progress is being threatened by a rise in diagnoses of common cancers such as breast and prostate. Diane needed surgery and a dozen rounds of chemotherapy. She now shares her story to educate others and help reduce disparities in health care. So for 10 years, I had been complaining since I was 34, and I just felt like no one really listened. And as a black woman, these are things that we deal with. She says, advocate for yourself and go get screened. There's good news in the global fight against smoking tobacco. We have 19 million less smokers than we had two years ago. A new report from the World Health Organization shows 1.25 billion people smoke. That's about one in five people down from one in three in the year 2000. The region uh, that is um, a bit of a problem is the European region, where especially women are, uh, uh, you know, on the increase in some parts in some countries um, or at very high levels still of tobacco users. Dr. Rudiger Kreck is the director of health promotion at the WHO. He says an alarming number of children are using e-cigarettes and recommends countries take strong regulatory measures. We have seen this, for instance, in what they call novel products on e-cigarettes and vaping, where they actually try to get our children as young as eight years old to actually use e-cigarettes or vapors. This is, I believe, criminal. But they do, and in many countries, these um, use of e-cigarettes and vaping are not yet regulated. The report shows Africa has the lowest tobacco use at just under 10 percent. According to the CDC, cigarette smoking is linked to about 80 to 90 percent of lung cancer deaths in the U.S. But for non-smokers, radon is the biggest threat. During this Radon Action Month, we hear from one woman who knows full well the dangers of this odorless and colorless gas. Bonnie Mueller was shocked to learn she had stage 4 lung cancer. I was told I had lung cancer in my left lung. It had metastasized to my liver and my lymph nodes and my pancreas, and I had a lump on my breast. The mother of three was a runner and a non-smoker. They asked if I had better, ever been exposed to radon, and 10 years ago, I didn't even know what that was. I wasn't even on my radar for something. Radon is an odorless, colorless, radioactive gas that's naturally released from rocks, soil, and water. 
Bonnie is from Minnesota, which has a cold climate. Radon levels there are three times higher than the national average. Radon levels are usually higher in homes during the winter months when temperatures freeze the ground, trapping the gas in the soil. And the, the radon at our cabin was off the charts. It, it was so high. It's estimated that radon causes about 21,000 lung cancer deaths in the United States each year. So the only way to know if it's in your home is to test for it. The CDC recommends testing your home if it's never been or if radon levels are unknown, if you're buying or selling a home, before and after any renovations, or if you spend more time in the basement. At-home tests cost $10 to $12 and can be purchased at the hardware store, something Mueller wishes she knew about sooner. The devastating effects of cancer, if there's any way to prevent it by doing a simple test, do it. She shares her story to raise awareness. Back-to-back -back announcements from the royal family caught the UK off guard. Both the king and his daughter-in-law are facing health scares. Buckingham Palace says King Charles III will undergo surgery for an enlarged prostate. The palace describes it as a corrective procedure and says the condition is benign. The National Health Service says more than a third of British men will face some issues with prostate enlargement in their lifetime. And as the prostate gets bigger, it can block the normal passage of urine from the bladder to the outside. Normally, you can take care of it in a lot of people with just medications. And sometimes you need a procedure to help open up that passageway. What made the announcement more of a shock is that less than two hours earlier came news that the king's daughter-in-law, the Princess of Wales, was already in the hospital. Kensington Palace says Princess Kate was admitted to the London Clinic for a planned abdominal surgery. The statement says the procedure was successful and that her condition was non-cancerous. It offered no other details other than that the 42-year-old future queen could be hospitalized for up to two weeks. It is very significant. It doesn't mean it's a life-threatening situation by any means, but there are lots of procedures people don't want to have discussed. It is personal to them. The palace said Kate hopes to maintain as much normality as possible for her three children. She's put, always put herself as a mother first, and she doesn't want her children to be exposed to any kind of speculation or intrusion. And so this very, very crafty statement was put out 100% with a mind to protecting those three children. The princess apologized for postponing her upcoming events, which will also be the case for the 75-year-old king. The palace says he'll be facing a short period of recuperation. There have been several confirmed cases of measles in the Philadelphia area since December, prompting health officials to urge parents to have their children vaccinated against the virus. Officials in the Washington, D.C. area are also warning air travelers that they may have been exposed at Dulles International or Ronald Reagan National Airports earlier this month. For more on this, we spoke with Dr. Celine Gounder, a CBS News medical contributor and editor-at-large for public health at KFF Health News. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us. I, I want to talk about measles. We are starting to see measles outbreaks again, and, and I guess the big question is why is this coming up? Why is this an issue again? This is really a reflection of a drop in vaccination rates across the country. And some of this uh, preceded the COVID pandemic. People were concerned about some of the safety issues around measles vaccination in particular. Those concerns have been debunked. Uh, but then during COVID, you had people not going in to see their pediatrician because they were afraid of COVID. And then also this backlash against vaccines uh, related to COVID that has extended to all the routine childhood immunizations now. Many children still get vaccinated for this. It's, in fact, it's required in some places. So why are we starting to see our parents opting out of this? Well, the vast majority of children are still getting their vaccines. The issue is with measles, you really need to have over 90, 95 percent of children vaccinated in order not to see cases of measles in the community. And we have seen vaccination dra uh, rates drop below those numbers, particularly in areas where parents can claim non-medical exemptions. So in other words, there's not a medical reason for the child to not get vaccinated, they're just opting out. And so where you see um, those kinds of non-medical exemptions, you have 10, 20% of kids who are not getting their measles vaccinations. And that's enough to allow measles cases to occur. One of the big pieces of misinformation I see out there is that a lot of people think that measles is a mild illness. Uh, it can potentially be serious. Measles can be very serious, and this is one of the reasons it was such a big win and also prioritized for vaccine development back in the 1950s or so. 
Polio, measles, these have very severe consequences in a certain percentage of kids. Measles in particular can cause very severe deadly pneumonia, can also cause brain infections. And uh, even if a child survives that, there can be long-term uh, neurological impairment as a result of those infections. Is it similar for adults or, is, or does it present differently? Well, adults can have those same kinds of consequences as well. Again, that very severe pneumonia, the encephalitis, the brain infection, and uh, in pregnant women who used to get measles, fortunately we don't see that so much in the United States anymore, they could have very deadly uh, cases of measles. How contagious is measles? Measles is one of the most infectious diseases known to man, which is also why you need to have such high vaccination rates to prevent cases from occurring if there is an exposure. Well, Dr. Gowder, thanks so much for sharing that information with us. My pleasure. Public health officials are still urging Americans to get vaccinated against COVID, flu, and RSV, saying it's not too late to protect yourself as the winter drags on. This is the first time I have known the flu to be horrible. Mary Stein missed getting her son James flu shot this year. And when the three-year-old got the flu, he needed a few nights in a Dallas hospital. His cough got so strong and so hard. We've been here since Wednesday night, diagnosed with flu A, and then that turned into right side pneumonia. Kids like James have kept Dr. Stephanie Atia with Dallas Medical City Children's Hospital busy for months. One thing that's a little unusual this flu season is that we're seeing both flu A and flu B more or less at the same time. The CDC says flu vaccination rates are at their lowest in five years. The holidays are over, which means for much of the country, it's nothing but gray skies overhead while those warm summer months are still far off in the distance. That can trigger seasonal affective disorder. But there's another type of depression to look out for as well. I would say since the pandemic, we've we've had more incidents of persistent depressive disorder in our country. Persistent depressive order is a mild to moderate chronic depression that lasts for two years or more. Board certified psychiatrist Dr. Nina Serfolio says the past couple of years have been difficult for many, but it's important to know when it's time to get help. And persistent depressive disorder basically consists of feeling sad, or empty. It's not where people may be so impaired they can't get out of bed. According to therapist Marissa Nelson, many people don't realize their constant blasé feeling is a health problem. Why I think that it might go undiagnosed is that people think that maybe this is their personality. Nelson recommends people who think they have persistent depressive order see a therapist, avoid isolation, exercise more, and do things that bring you joy. Coming up, a study used identical twins to find out the benefits of a vegan diet. And we look at the potentially deadly disease X. Welcome back. It's a deadly disease that doesn't exist yet, but it will cause 20 times more fatalities than COVID-19. That's the hypothetical posed by Disease X, which global leaders tackled at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. According to the World Health Organization, Disease X represents the knowledge that a serious international epidemic could be caused by an unknown pathogen. Disease X was adopted by the WHO in 2018, well before the COVID pandemic. High income countries were surprised because their investments in the last many decades was on high tech technology, high, you know, cutting edge technology in tertiary services, even robotic surgery. But their investment in primary health care was not there. Even some countries couldn't do contact tracing. So to prepare countries, I think. Renewed commitment to strengthen primary health care is, is, is very important. The world was caught flat-footed. So Dr. Amesh Adalja is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Well, the whole idea of Disease X is about being proactive, thinking about what do you need to do to make a vaccine, what are the antiviral targets, what type of diagnostic tests do you need to have in place. Should Dr. Adalja hopes politicians stay out of future public health crises so life-saving messages are not discounted by the public. Have a sore muscle or joint? It might actually be your fascia that's causing the trouble. 
It's a tissue paper thin layer that covers your muscles and joints, and doctors are now finding there's a lot more to it than previously thought. Dr. Malika Marshall has more. And what the foam roll does, it just kind of mechanically separates the fascia from the muscles. Grant Ward has been working with a physical therapist and shoulder pain made it tough to do simple tasks. Literally going into a parking lot and getting a ticket out of the booth was very difficult. Since then, he's learned a lot about fascia and how it can trigger pain. You know that thin, slimy film on chicken? That's what we're talking about. It's a series of protective coverings on our muscles, joints, and tendons. We now know it's much more than that. It composes a 3D structure for support, um, has nerve endings for feeling, uh, and also can send out signals for pain. According to Dr. Sarav Shah, co-chief of sports medicine at the New England Baptist, when muscles feel sore, it may actually be the fascia is inflamed or has adhesions, meaning instead of being smooth, it becomes crinkled or gummy. When you have a sore muscle, you're probably going to get stiff, and the stiffness comes from the adhesions that form around the coverings, right, the fascia. So how do you keep your fascia healthy in the first place? That's a good question, right? So short answer is resistance training. This helps uh, remodel your fascia to optimal tension length covering. That's why Grant is still meeting with the physical therapist because he's seeing benefits throughout his body. So certainly range of motion is definitely better and I'm absolutely stronger. And he can now reach that parking ticket no problem. Dr. Malika Marshall, CBS News, Boston. A study used identical twins to examine the health benefits of a vegan diet. Danya Backus spoke to a pair of sisters to see how it went. Rosalind Morehouse and Carolyn Sedeco sacrificed their diets for research. My uniqueness is tethered to the fact that there is someone else who is genetically the same as me. They were just one set of 22 identical twins who Stanford researchers studied for eight weeks, comparing vegan and omnivore diets. Carolyn was randomly selected as the vegan. It was challenging, just as I had expected. Both diets were healthy full of vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and void of starches and refined sugars. The vegan diet had no animal products. The omnivore included chicken, fish, eggs, cheese, dairy, and other animal sourced food. They made really significant changes in a number of nutrients, a number of foods, even the omnivores. Christopher Gartner is a nutrition scientist at Stanford University and the lead author of the study. He found vegan eaters saw the most improvement to their cardiovascular health. That the LDL cholesterol dropped by 14 milligrams per deciliter, which was more than a 10% drop. They didn't have high insulin levels to begin with, but they dropped in the vegan group and they lost a little bit of weight. Carolyn and Rosalind say both diets helped change their eating habits. I feel even more empowered to say of all these um, things I can choose, I'm going to choose the healthier option or the plant forward option. Gartner says even a nudge in the plant-based direction can improve health. Donya Back is CBS News, Los Angeles. After the break, the health benefits behind a runny nose out in the cold, and how doctors gave this girl a brand new ear. Welcome back. Braving the outdoors in chilly temperatures can result in a runny nose, but there is a reason for it. And why do some noses run more than others? For those answers, Jeff Wagner reports from Minneapolis, where low temperatures were recently below zero. Winter's wrath can still be welcoming, but a skier knows their nose, the Kleenex is a definite must, isn't having as much fun. When the cold wind blows, the sense of nose will flow. A poetic reminder from allergist Dr. John Sweet. Why do our noses run in cold weather? The purpose of the nose is to warm and humidify the air 
uh, before it enters down into our lungs to prevent irritation. The nose can turn air that's below zero to a balmy 80 degrees instantly with 100% humidity. So the blood vessels uh, actually swell and expand that causes the sensation of a congestion or stuffy nose. Then mucus production ramps up to keep the air moist, turning some noses into faucets. There's times you come out here and you can just see beards and everybody's got drippy stuff all over the, all over the place. How much mucus could we produce in these situations? Oh yeah, e easily up to a half a liter or even more if you have a really strong response. Oh. Vasomotor rhinitis, <laughs> aka skier nose, is worse for people with allergies, asthma, eczema, and women over 50 years old. They are strongly reacting to other environmental allergens and so they have a, can have a much stronger reflex when they're exposed to dry, cold, dry air. It can definitely take away from the, the ambiance a little, but um, it's just a part of winter sports as a whole, I guess. Not just winter sports, spicy food, cigarette smoke, even strong odors like perfume can trigger our noses in the same way cold air does. There are ways, though, to lessen the symptoms. A good way to help prevent that is to try to warm the air before it enters the nose. So putting, wearing a scarf to cover the nose actually can help. I use this gator um, and just to every once in a while cover my face. As well as um, using uh, over-the-counter medications like uh, that are available now, like azelastine or antihistamine nasal spray. Jeff Wagner, CBS News, Minneapolis. Now, as for our pets being outside, while many have a nice furry coat to help them keep warm, it doesn't mean they aren't affected by the cold. The American Veterinary Medical Association says most pets are susceptible to frostbite and hypothermia and to keep them inside as much as possible when temperatures drop. For dogs, shorten walks, check paws for cold weather injuries, and put a sweater or coat on them. The team at the Humane Society in South Bend, Indiana, where temperatures have been in the single digits, says don't leave your pet alone outside. Keep it brief, just to go out to go potty, come back inside. You're looking at their paw pads too. It's really easy for ice and snow to get compacted into their paws. If you have salt down, you want to make sure that you're using pet safe salt. Um, and you, like I said, just keep it quick. The Humane Society recommends calling animal control if you find an animal out in the cold. Even these farm animals at this stock show in Denver need extra help staying warm. Heaters are brought in for the pigs, while this owner uses a special blower to keep their cow dry. We finish with a new kind of reconstructive surgery that's turned a little girl's life around. Stephanie Stahl reports from Philadelphia. Well, you know, Prepping are going for a life-changing okay. surgery. I feel like you're giving me good luck. High five! High five! Liliana Perales is headed to the OR, her parents filled with anticipation and worry. I love you, my girl. Liliana was born without an ear. Her parents decided she should have surgery to create a new one so she wouldn't get teased and feel self-conscious. We all wanted her just to feel complete and whole and um, not feel any different. The family turned to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Liliana has hemifacial microsomia causes part of the face not to develop as rest of the rest of the face. Dr. Jordan Swanson says it's a relatively common condition. With Liliana's case, she hears from her other ear, so the operation was to create an artificial external ear. So this is the challenge. We have to reconstruct this. Instead of the traditional surgery using cartilage from the ribs, Dr. Swanson is now working with a medical grade plastic framework. And it has little pores through it that actually the body's tissue can grow into. It. During the six hour operation, tissue from the skull and skin grafts are used with the plastic frame to create Liliana's new ear. We're done. Did she do good? She did great. Yay. She did really well. Really? Thank you. The five year old's ear is under wraps for some healing. Then the big reveal. Can you look in the mirror and see your new ear? She didn't want to look in the mirror in the beginning because it was like different. And now the ear is completely healed. Did that just fix my ear? Do you love it? Yeah. She is so happy that she has two of everything now and she is just, she feels so complete now. Which includes having pierced ears. I'm so excited for the life that she has ahead. The family is filled with gratitude and excited for Liliana's future. Stephanie Stahl, CBS News, Philadelphia. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us and be well. <laughs>